Hey. Um, so I don't know if anyone knows me, but I'm one of the co-organizers here, and as Cormac said, I work at Intercom on, as a product engineer. Um, so I'm now going to talk about Flexbox, which has nothing to do with JavaScript, um, but I was meant to give this as a lightning talk. What's that? Oh, yeah, it's good. <laughs> I was meant to give this as a, a lightning talk last month, month, but it was sick, so I've kind of extended it, and we'll see how we go. Um, so I don't know if many people have seen this, but this always appears on, on Twitter every now and again. Um, it's generally a lot of people's experience with CSS. And generally when they talk, when they see this, and this is their pain for CSS, they're generally talking about layout. Um, you know, the, the font stuff, the style stuff, the uh, colors, that's, that's all cool. But when it comes to like laying stuff out on the page, um, CSS doesn't really help us out there. Um, so traditionally, like, the web was this, like for uh, for documents, um, but now this day and age we have these complex UIs, and the tools we have at the moment aren't really that great. Um, so, and also now we have, you know, you're no longer just looking at it on the uh, a browser, or sorry, in a, the desktop. You have like multiple devices with multiple screen sizes. And um, so, what options do we have, like with regards layout? So tables. This is like the the OG layout uh, system. So like screw your CSS, let's just do layout and markup. Um, if you've had to maintain um, like a, a table heavy layout, um, yeah, you've, you feel pain. Generally, um, if you wanted a complex layout, you'd have like lots of nested um, tables, uh, set widths. Wasn't the most flexible, wasn't very maintainable. Um, in general, it's not semantic either. Like I'm not a semantic, kind of zeal it, but um, generally tables are just for like show, uh, prov or displaying data, not really for layout. Um, but worst of all, like the basic developer experience for tables is awful. If you've ever had to maintain like HTML newsletters, which in this, day's a, this day and age we're still doing because of client email client shittiness, um, yeah, this is, it's not good. So floats, um, this is probably the most used form of you know creating layouts uh, so basically like you shift a box around the line um, traditionally for you know, the, the way the web was with pages and images this was great you float an image left the text would just run alongside it but over time like we've kind of shoehorned this into using it for more complex layouts and it doesn't really suit the, the tool for the job and um, one of the main problems is was when you put something in a float, it, it moves out a document flow, as you can see here. So we have two elements, you float them left, the parent just goes, oh, I've no children, and just collapses. So over the years, we've had all sorts of hacks just to make this work. Um, you used to stick a div in with like clear boat, so it'd make it, um, the parent, you know, encapsulate them, or, um, or like use overflow or some stuff like this. Um, but this is the kind of the most way people do it now is like the clear fix, um, which is this is an example of the one which is in um, the HTML5 boilerplate. When it's called micro clear fix, so instead of using a div, you're just using a pseudo element. Um, and this has actually become more popular. People use an inline block to do layout. It's actually quite flexible in that because inline is for laying out text, you can do some nifty stuff like you can reverse all the divs by you know, using the direction um, property, or you can center all the text just by using like text line center. But because it's, you know, for laying out text, it's white, white space dependent. And the problem with that is, is that you s if you line up all these divs, you get this horrible little um, like three or four pixel gap in between each element. So to rectify that, there's all sorts of hacky ways of getting rid of it. So one is like doing margin margin left, margin right, like minus four pixels. Um, another one is you set font size zero on the parent, and then, so that'll make them shrink up, and then you put back the actual font size back on the, the, the children. Um, and the, probably the most hacky I've seen is where you actually remove the, the end tag. The HTML5 allows you to do this, and people do it, where you remove the end tag, and actually the, it works. Another one I've seen in, um, Anyway, CSS is where they, they put comments in between the start and the end of the tag, um, so that it just strips all white space. 
it's kind of nasty, but it's, you know, people do disastrous things just to do what they want. This is one that I haven't seen often, but it's, it's been done. So essentially, you're absolutely positioning everything on the page. Um, so this is a, a framework called GSS. It's pretty cool what it is, but essentially it's a, it's a, it's a JavaScript framework which tries to implement iOS's auto layout. I don't know if anyone knows what that is. And it implements something called, I'm not gonna get into the details, it's kind of crazy, it's called the Cassowary Constraint Solver. And what it does is it allows you to define your, your elements on the page in relation to each other. For example, I don't know if you can see that, we have a H1 and its center is equal to the, the x-axis of the, the P tag to the center of the, the image. And no matter how much you shrink that, or, um, the JavaScript will work out exactly where the center is and where this should lie. And if you can see down the bottom, probably not. Um, it uses JavaScript and basically just absolutely positions these in the page. Um, while it's cool, it, I don't know if it's really production-wise, because every time you, you resize, you're, you have to recalculate your whole layout. So I guess this brings us to um, Flexbox. So it's been around a few years, so about, it's like 2009, but it's only really, really in the last um, two or three years where it kind of it's got a lot of people using it. And the reason is, is it's kind of gone through a lot of um, flux. So there's been three major rewrites of the spec. Um, the first two rewrites, they were pretty much, they didn't work. They were implemented by some browsers. Um, in particular, the second one was only implemented by, I think, by IE9. Um, but now the latest spec, it it's pretty much works in all evergreen browsers, um, which is a good thing. Um, so on the, in regards to layout on the web, we have block for like laying out document level stuff. We have inline for text. We have tables for tabular data. We have positions for like laying out stuff not in relation to anything else on the page. And then we have flex, which supposedly is meant to cure all our woes for de developing uh, complex UIs. So there's a few key concepts, I think, with, um, with Flexbox. I'm not gonna go through all of them tonight because it, it's probably not worth it. I don't want to bore you to death. But I think when people first come to Flexbox, they, a few of the concepts are a bit abstract and quite complex. But actually, if you can work out the two or three main points, it actually, most of it then kind of fits together quite well. Um, so one of the core concepts is the, the point of the flex container and the flex items. So whereas with floats and say absolutely positioning stuff, you're positioning um, just the items and they don't kind of care about anything else on the page. Um, with Flexbox, it's all about the parent. Probably 90% of the, um, the rules which you apply, apply to the parent. And how that works is the parent then directly affects um, all its direct children. And um, so, it, so any rules are on the parent, that's how the, the children behave. Um, and another key point is axes. So there's two main axes. Um, it's, so the main axes is how the, is the main <coughs> direction of where the items flow. So for example, we have one, two, and three. So they're going from left to right, and that's the main axis. So the main axis, and then you have the cross axis, which always goes perpendicular to the, the main axis. And you can switch the direction of the main axis, but the principle is always the same. So, you, so there's rules or uh, properties which allow you to you know, place things along these axes, but once you understand how the axes work and how you place things along the axes, that's most of Flexbox. Um, but the problem, so for example, this is default, flex direction row. If I took that away, um, this would still operate as is. You can do flex direction row, row reverse, and what it's done now, it's flipped it, gone from right to left. The main axis is right to left now, and the cross axis is still perpendicular from top to bottom. If you do flex direction column, the main axis now is from top to bottom, the cross axis is perpendicular again from left to right. And similarly, you have column reverse, which is um, bottom to top and then left to right. So there are the four directions, if you can understand that. And then 
understand how to manipulate things along these axes, you've kind of got Flexbox. So there's two ways. So you can manipulate, um, there's selectors for, or sorry, rules for um, manipulating each, each axis. They're not very intuitive. Like if you look at that, yeah, how are you meant to know which is which? So justify content works with the main axis. Align items works with the cross axis. So in my own head, I was like, I need to remember this. So I just thought, oh, main axis, justify content, cool. M and J, king of pop. <laughs> so if you just think of that, you'll always remember um, main axis, justify content, and you nailed it. Um, so I'm gonna try some lo live coding, which is always, always bad, but we'll see. So, so for example, this is, um, so here we have just four divs, and this is how to look on the page. Just to get going on the flex container, just go display flex. And now they magically go into a grid. So now, as I was saying before, we have a, a main, the main axis goes from left to right. And if I apply now a justify content property, I can now move these along this main axis. So if I go justify content, if I could type. So by default, it's got a property called flex start, and that's the top left. But then if I go flex end, they'll magically jump over there. Other properties include center, just go into the center. So the parent is, is looking at his children and all the available space, and then dynamically kind of just moving it into that space. So if I like re resize my browser, it'll always be in the center. So there's another one called space between. And basically what it does is it works out the space and then evenly divides it between them. And there's another one space around. And it kind of works similar to the last one, except it kind of um, it places the space around them rather than kind of, I don't know how you describe it, it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then we have align items. So align items works along the cross axis. So again, the default is flex start. But that's doing nothing there. Um, Oh, actually, uh, I left in a bit of code, which I shouldn't have, but yeah. Okay, so we have flex start, but if you go flex end, it jumps to the bottom. Again, we have center. And then we have a cool one called baseline. So what this does, this is, um, so what it does is it looks at all the fonts and tries to line up all the fonts in relation to each other. So say, so each of these has a class of one, two, three, four. So say I do the first one is like a class of font of 50. That's gonna jump. So one, is they're all on the same level now. And similarly, if I do it for the, the next one. Yeah. Let's go nuts. So that's pretty cool. Like that's generally, if you had to do that, you'd, you'd need like some serious JavaScript just to work that out. Whereas we have the, the browser doing it for us. So that's really cool. Um, so then, so by default, everything sits on a single line. So looking here, this concept of sitting on a single line is known as a flex line. And by default, it doesn't wrap. So if I get this and go nuts, just duplicating stuff, these will all just get squashed onto the single line. And even if you set a width on these guys, um, the browser's gonna try and squeeze these in as mu many as they can, just so it fits in that space. So you'll have like content like jumping outside. So there's actually a property called flex wrap. And what that does then is it works out the, the width and then it creates multiple flex lines. And then there's another property called align content. 
And what this does, this um, works out the relationship between the different lines. So if we go, jump to the top, jump to the end. Jump to the center. Um, I think there's another one I can't remember, but that's a yeah. Um, and then probably one really cool feature is with Flexbox you have true source order independence. So if I go back to my four items, so where usually you just apply it to the parent. If you, you can actually apply an order to each individual item, so say one. Um, so that's actually jumped to the end, and the reason this one has jumped to the end is because by default, um, everything is of an order zero. So you can also do um, minuses, so say four. That four and I was jumped to the front. So this is like pretty powerful stuff, like and um, like like different viewports using media queries. This is like traditionally, this is very hard to do unless you use JavaScript. Um, so then, I guess I don't know if you've seen this. So this thing is called Flexbox Froggy. So you might try and see now if we can work out what we should do here. So anyone, any suggestions? So we have these two frogs. We want to get these guys into the middle. We have the main axis. You think of Michael Jackson. <laughs> justify text. Justify, yeah, justify content. Close. Content. Yeah. Content. Nailed it. There we go. So we take it up a notch. <laughs> <laughs> Three froggies. So now I think we're going to need a column of some sort. So what's that? So I bet we do direction first. Flex direction, yeah. Ah, but we want the red guy at the top, so. Yeah, there we go. So now, so now the main axis has now become the column, and we now want to spread these guys out. There we go. Yep. So now this one. Level 24, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, so we'll see how we go. So, any ideas to start? Are we gonna go rows or are we gonna go columns? Columns. Yeah, I think. All right, yeah. So now, center and row. Okay, I think we're Center's right. <coughs> okay, there was a property. Uh, so now, because we want to separate them, Just we can use. Yep. Yeah. So, flex. Okay, so I didn't tell you about this one, but there's a wrap reverse. So now we have these guys, you want to separate them completely? Basically. Yep. Uh, 
Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, wait, sorry. So align items is just for the cross axis, but because we've multiple rows, we need to do align content. There we go. So now you all know Flexbox. Um, so if we go back to the slides. So hacks now, which Flexbox um, means we can get rid of, is equal high columns. So now you just simply go display flex. Something I didn't mention was that um, by default, um, the align items has a property called stretch. And what that does is the item will just grow to 100% of the container. So if you wanted to do this in the good old days, I remember there's a hack called the faux column hack where you used to apply, um, used to put the, the columns actually as a background image on the container. Because you had all these guys as different heights, um, it looked like they were a column. And so you'd actually have those three colors as a background. Um, other ones I've done myself is like writing JavaScript to work out the, the greatest height and then apply that to all the columns. It used to get tricky when you had like multiple rows and each row would have um, different heights. So then you'd have to you know take it in, in groups of three or something like that. So equal height columns, two or three lines of code. Centering in the unknown. This is like, uh, yeah, this is, when I first seen this, I, I just couldn't believe it. It's like all the heartache and pain over the years, like just doing centering, like for God's sake. Um, so one hack, so one hack or like if you had, if you knew the, the width and height of something, you could kind of easily do it by going position absolute, shift something to the left, so it was in the middle and then doing margin left the width of the item and yeah, it was magically, uh, in the center, but if that grew anyway, you'd, yeah, you had to do, use JavaScript or something. You'd use tables, but that was kind of nasty. Um, whereas now, you know, three lines of code and this can grow to as high or as wide as you want and it'll always be like in the center. Um, so as was shown earlier, source ordering. So with responsive now, you know, um, your content may have different priorities, so on a, a Say in a desktop, you'll have your sub nav at the top, you'll have your main content, but when it, that shrinks to a smaller device, um, you want your main content as high up the, up the, up the screen. You wanna put the menu at the bottom or maybe your sub nav down the bottom. Um, so things people have done was you'd actually duplicate the, the content and show and hide it depending on what viewport it is. Um, something I've done myself is using JavaScript to copy content around the page and there's a cool library called uh, Append Around, which is done by the Filament Group in Boston. Um, I use that an awful lot. Um, but now, just using Flexbox, order, and media queries, it's easily done. So example, this, this is just a demo from a guy called Jordan Wilson, I believe. So he has like a, a header, a navigation, main content, but he wants the navigation then to move to the bottom. So when it goes to a smaller screen, it becomes one, three, I think four and then two, and yeah, no JavaScript involved. So, browser support. Um, so I guess if you're lucky like me, working here, we only deal with evergreen browsers. Like even IE 11, I don't even think, do we support IE 11? Yeah, oh yeah, we do, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so IE 11 is, so, all the evergreen browsers, IE 11 is weird in that it has, it's it does the latest spec, but it's extremely buggy. Um, IE 10 has the old spec, which I think no one implemented except IE. And if you want to implement it in IE 9 and IE 8, you have to use like a JavaScript library or something like that. Um, but otherwise, yeah, th I guess it's getting a lot of traction now because it's been used and it can be used in a lot of browsers. So wrapping up, Flexbox is uh, Flexbox. Flexbox is pretty much ready. Like if you only care about evergreen browsers, at first, on the surface, like some of the terminology and how things work is a bit weird. Um, and it, yeah, but if you just learn a few key concepts, it actually kind of all falls into place. There's a lot more than what I 
spoke about tonight, but there I think is the main part of Flexbox. And as you've seen, it allows you to create really complex layout layouts really easily. No more hacks, and um, I'll put them on the slides, but there's lots of really amazing resources out there, and I pretty much robbed from all of them just to make this. Um, so, thank you. Any questions? Yeah. On the one of the last uh, slide, you showed that uh, one guy just uh, yeah he, yeah uh, <coughs> changed the width of the window and then the content uh, changed the order. Yeah. Is it uh, used uh, uh, by uh, media queries? Media queries. Yeah. yeah? So in the media queries, queries you can't apply different CSS rules uh, on the fly. You just but you if yeah, you, it's just. Um, Media yeah, just media queries, and uh, if you wanted to use JavaScript, you could do it. Like box, uh, yeah. yeah, so it's just it's pure CSS, yeah. which is really good. Yeah? If you want to uh, vertically align something, you have to, I think you have to set the parent. Just like, I, I play around with it a bit. Mm -hmm. I have to set the parent to be 100% of the view profile. Um, yeah, so... so things that actually center for me. So by default, yeah, the par I don't think the parent is going to grow it's gonna just fill up the content. But like if you, yeah, so you can s you just basically set your container to be the size you want, but then it's gonna say, hey, kid, you know, just go right to the center of me. Um, but you do have to set a height and the parent. Like yeah, or you could just do like, or you could just do. It for me, I just wasn't too sure if I have to actually do that. So what I did in my demo back then was I used 100 VH, which is like 100% of the viewport height. It's really, it's handy. Um, but like, yeah, the like thing is like 100%, like it doesn't have to be an explicit height. Mm -hmm. But yeah, once it, once you have a height, it'll try to center itself in it. Sure. Yeah. Do you recommend uh, a polyfill maybe for I-9 to be better? I don't know, like, probably I-9 isn't too bad with regards to JavaScript. I-8, I remember it was, it's pretty shit, like performance wise. And if this, I can imagine it's probably quite intensive if um, you're kind of recalculating layout and stuff on resize and um, yeah, I think probably when, yeah. So one thing I used to do when I worked at an agency when we used to do responsive websites, um, we never bothered with IE8. So what we used to do, we used to serve a different style sheet to IE8 and just have it static. So say it's it's 960, and then um, the other style sheet would go to other browsers that support media queries, and just like they'll have the full respo re responsive experience. It's kind of different here, I guess, because Flexbox is kind of all or nothing a, a bit. But um, I don't know. Your miles may vary. I probably wouldn't with i8, because I did initially. I remember once trying to use in some sort of media query support for i8, and it just wasn't great. Just like um, recalculation time and stuff, but i nine is better. Yeah, what about a flexbox polyfill for i nine for i eleven? Um, so i eleven and i ten work, but they're buggy. Um, i sorry, i ten and i eleven are buggy. i nine, there's one called flexibility, which I believe is good. It's probably good in i nine. i eight, I wouldn't. I as in like just I'd say it's probably quite intensive. So. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah, it'd probably help you out there. Yeah. So I think with stuff like this, it's the, I guess, diminishing returns when you get to, depends on your audience, I guess. If you're building a, an intranet site for like Bank of Ireland or someone, sorry, Bank of Ireland, if you're, but um, <laughs> like, and imagine, yeah, XP, IE8, it's their main experience. Um, you probably have to, go all in with like floats or whatever, but if it's like 1%, yeah, just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't, thankfully I don't have to deal in that world anymore, so. Um, any other questions? No, all right, thanks.